Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Today I'm really excited. We promised you, audience, from last podcast where they talked a little bit about special needs planning that they were going to bring on a special guest on this show, and that is Mike Byrne. John and Michael, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Eric. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Michael, I know you're sitting right there with your dad, ready to do this. I am. Yeah, excited. This is going to be a, a great podcast, and we've, we've been looking forward to having Michael on here for, well, a couple of weeks since we recorded the last one, so this is going to be great. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. John, I know that you started the relationship with Mike. Why don't you tell us a little about that? Oh, sure did, right, Michael? <laughs> we've known yes, you did. Time. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about today because Michael and I not only are, are colleagues, we're also dear friends. We've had, we are, we've had a friendship for th- over 30 years. And Michael and I, uh, as we worked together in my previous employment, uh, we, we looked at special needs planning as a focus in our practices because we saw a, a dire need for that type of planning. And Michael and I uh, spent a lot of time together working on cases and developing a philosophy around that service. And Michael's our specialist that we refer business to when we come across a case uh, of special needs. Um, as you all know, Copper Beach has taken a different road. We're more of a family office type structure. We don't, we don't focus on any particular planning uh, process. So when we get these type of uh, situations with special needs, we refer people, uh, our clients, to Michael as a specialist. Um, so let me give you background on Michael. Michael is not only, a, 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 as I said, a special friend. Um, there, there's a meaning to his life when it comes to special needs. He has a wonderful daughter who's pretty much my girlfriend, Michael. She's still my girlfriend. She still loves me. That, that's what she thinks, John. Kelsey, she's a <laughs> sweetheart. Um, not only does Michael have a special needs daughter who's very special, he has two brothers also with special needs. So Michael has a family uh, of, w- with that focus, and, and he comes from that perspective, and which drives his passion to uh, work in this field. So we have a, we have a couple of processes that we're going to work with today. Michael and I talked yesterday about having four or five key topics. Again, this podcast is going to be 30 minutes approximately, so we can't do, you know, dig too deep in any one specific piece. But I asked Michael to come up with four or five focuses that he wants to talk about today. I'm just going to turn over to Michael. And uh, Michael, let's hear some of your magic. Great. Well, I look forward to sharing this. Um, it's, a, it's a complex uh, dilemma that families face uh, when they have a special needs child, and then when they start to unpack the things that are required to build that future care plan, um, it gets overwhelming for a lot of uh, a lot of families. So, you know, l- let me start by, you know, as both a, a planner for 30 years, but as a parent and as a sibling, watching my 89 year old mother try and navigate benefits for my brothers. And every year or every four years when an administration changes in a given state, the rules and the benefits change oftentimes. So it's real important to understand what those support systems are. So, you know, they say the prayer of a special needs parent is that that they have that their child has this long and happy life, but that the parents live one day longer that one day longer so they can be sure that their kids are safe, that they have, uh, they don't have wants and needs. So, and that for most parents, the reality is, although that's their prayer, the reality is that won't happen. So what, you know, what John and I have done over the years is when we've met these families, help them, we've helped them craft a future care plan that steps in when they're no longer here. So when we do that, uh, one of the key components is understanding government benefits. Um, most people are going to have to rely on government benefits to be sure they can tap into those services and those funds for their special needs child. And getting those benefits is is cumbersome and complicated and maintaining them. As I said, every four years, it seems like there's a change in the rules. So maintaining those benefits is critical. So the, the first and the most I guess, essential benefit 
that special needs families need to understand and acquire is SSI or supplemental security income. So this benefit is the door that opens up all Medicaid funding. So, and it's, it's really, it's, we used to know it in the old days as welfare, but it's the program the government put in place to help those that don't have assets, which includes special needs uh, young adults. So once a, uh, a special needs child hits the age of 18, they're eligible for SSI. And what, mean, what needs to happen is they and their parents need to contact Social Security and make that appointment, go down, and they need to prove that, number one, the child is special needs, but that's an easy thing to do with an IEP or uh, medical records. And then once they do that, there's two other requirements these families need to con conform to. Number one is there's an asset limit. The child can have more than $2,000 in their name. And the second is an income limit. The child can earn above $1,200 a, a month. Uh, and with those two eligibilities, along with the special needs designation, they'll qualify for SSI. So that's the first step that parents need to, to navigate through. Um, when they do that, that opens up Medicaid eligibility. And Medicaid eligibility will help pay for residential care in the future, will help pay for job supports, will help pay for housing vouchers. So there's so many things that come through that door, but unless they're SSI eligible, they're more than likely not going to be Medicaid eligible. Hey, Michael, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in here. Do, do you find that the families struggle with trying to stay on top of all these changes that might be occurring or understanding, you know, the, the, maybe the inconsistencies of, of, of Medicaid? Is, is that something you see a lot? They, they, John, it's a great question, and they, they deeply struggle, and they struggle for two reasons. One is a lot of families are overwhelmed with just trying to take care of uh, the responsibilities of being a family and then having a special needs adult. So they're overwhelmed. And the second thing is the information. Um, and I don't mean this the right or wrong way, but when they contact Social Security and they try and get the information, oft, oftentimes the people at Social Security may not be as informed about SSI as they are about some of the other Social Security benefits. Mm -hmm. So sometimes clients walk away with a misunderstanding of what's what they're eligible for and their families are. So that's why it's, it's important, John, they seek out people like you and people like I, at least someone that can give them some guidance on, here's the steps you need to do. How do you get this benefit? Yeah, and I remember you and I had conversations uh, even, even recently on the challenges that a lot of the families have is finding good advisors that understand the complexity of this world. That's legal folks, accounting folks, and planning folks. I mean, do you, do you find that's pretty consistent? Uh, over the past uh, few years, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What, what, you know, what's your read on that? John, you're right. It's important that the, that families seek out good advisors. And, and let's look at the different areas because there's different advisors. On the financial side, um, there's not a lot of advisors out there that are familiar with government benefits. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. One is there's not a lot of money to be made, so a lot of people don't focus on it. And secondly, those benefits are and the qualification rules are different for each state so trying to train people into that is, is difficult you know i've been blessed i've had a mother for 40 50 years has kind of trained me on it so as a result when my daughter was born 30 years ago i was kind of skilled up but that's not most people's situation so finding an advisor who's familiar with special needs a financial advisor is critical and then that advisor the, the second thing you need is you need to find legal advisors so because part of what we're going to talk about today is what legal tools do you put in place to protect your special needs adult in the future. And you need an, an attorney that is familiar and experienced in that area. Uh, one of the things you're going to put in place most families is a special needs trust. And, you know, the problem with the trust is you don't know if it was done wrong until it's too late. So the important thing is to find an attorney that has experience and 
uh, knowledge in the area of special needs when you're doing your planning. Yeah, I th- and when we touched on, I think, uh, on the legal side, Michael, a little bit last podcast on uh, the, the various types of trusts that are formed. And I know that that's really a key component of what you do. And, and to echo your point, having a, a good legal team that understands that, I, I imagine you're probably more often than you would like, probably coaching the attorneys who maybe don't have some familiarity with these types of trusts on how to draft them, number one. So maybe you could touch a little bit on the types of trusts on the legal side uh, that should or you would recommend be put in place for these special needs children and sort of why that's a really important component of this type of planning. Yep. So the fundamental building block of a special needs plan is number one is getting the government benefits. But as I mentioned earlier, it's key that a child doesn't have more than $2,000 in their name. Now, when a parent passes away and says, I'm going to leave assets for the benefit of my special needs child, and I'm going to leave all assets equally to my three children, what typical will will say, all of a sudden that special needs child has more than 2000 in their name, and now they are disqualified from all their government benefits. So the tool to avoid that is a special needs trust. So the special needs trust, and I use my situation. At my passing, my assets go to my wife. At my wife's passing, those assets get split. Some go to the benefit of my son, who's typical and doesn't have special needs and was blessed with a college education. But the bulk of my assets will go into a special needs trust for the benefit of my special needs daughter. So this trust All assets in this trust, when it's drawn up correctly by a qualified attorney, does not count towards the $2,000. And that's that safety net in the future care plan that says, when I'm no longer here, my daughter's living in a house, maybe a group home, and she needs internet because that's how she connects with her friends. Well, government benefits don't pay for internet. They don't pay for dental. They don't pay for vacations. They don't pay for a lot of things in our quality of life. And the special needs trust is there to do that. It's that safety net to pay for those quality of care things. So it's essential that you have a a special needs trust drawn up that's there in place to accept those assets to be that safety net. Now, it's interesting. A lot of people have come to me and they say, well, I got a special needs trust. And at my death, it comes into place. And and that's typically how it was done in the past. But there's there's a fault with that. And John and I have uncovered that in a number of clients that we've worked with together. And oftentimes what we do as part of our planning is once a client has put their trust in place, We send a letter out to all the other family members saying, this is not a request for funds, but if it was your desire to leave money for my special needs daughter, it's imperative that you do not leave it to her directly, but leave it to the special needs trust dated X date. Um, And that's an essential component because oftentimes there's grandparents out there, there's aunts, uncles that would like to leave money. And sometimes they'll inadvertently put that in their will. And they'll, those monies, if not left to a special needs trust, will disqualify the special needs young adult. So putting that trust in place, sending that letter out to family members, but it's essential that if we have grandparents or aunts or uncles or family members who might want to leave money for a special needs family member, it's essential that trust be drawn up and takes, takes, uh, comes into place prior to the will. So it can be drawn up with a will, but it needs to be a separate standalone special needs trust. Michael, we often got questions and and we still get get them today. Who could actually set up this trust for my special needs child? I I know we have answers to that. You want to walk the audience through? Who can set that up? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, So anybody can. So oftentimes it's the parents that will set it up. Um, So I've set one up for my daughter. Uh, My dad set one up for um, for my two brothers. But uh, you know, two two points on that. Um, One is um, 
and I'll take you through the fault of a trust. And the second thing is um, who set it up. So the other thing is that oftentimes there's parents who are just overwhelmed and it's their intention to set up a special needs trust, just like it's their intention to do a lot of things. But because they're so overwhelmed, they never get to it. And that mortality thing looks like it's so far out there. So it doesn't get done. So in the world that, that I live in, and John, I know you've seen this a lot, it's oftentimes the grandparents that come to us and say, look, uh, my daughter or son, they're overwhelmed with their special needs child. Can I set up a trust? And the answer is absolutely. So we have a lot of grandparents that will set that trust up and put that trust in place. But it's a key component. I'll tell you a little personal story. When I was you know, just starting in my financial career, my dad had a will like most, uh, like a lot of special needs families. And it says, hey, um, he was unfamiliar with special needs trust. I was a new financial advisor. I was somewhat unfamiliar, had read about him, but not really knowledgeable. And my dad's will said, at my passing, um, I leave my assets to uh, my son, Michael, and I leave my assets for his two brothers to Michael, and Michael can take care of his two brothers. Now, my intentions would have been to do exactly as he wished, but the reality of life sometimes comes in, and that's a terrible plan. It's a terrible plan, and it's often done, and it's terrible for a couple of reasons. Even in the best marriages, and, and I think I have a strong one, if it were to go the other way, those assets become divisible assets in a divorce, and my brothers are threatened by a divorce that they had nothing to do with. Um, if I was to get into some type of automobile accident or had a legal liability coming after me and people were to come after my assets, my brother's assets would have been confiscated. Um, if I fell to the grips of gambling or some other vice that happens to people once in a while, there goes my brother's safety net. So the old way of, hey, let's give it to the child that doesn't have special needs and they'll take care of the other children in the family is a very faulty plan that should be avoided at all cost. Yeah. And, and you mentioned um, divorce. I know that some of the families that we've worked in the past, and I don't know the current stats, but am I correct, Michael, that the divorce rate in special needs family is a little higher than average because of the stress Absolutely. in the marriage? It's, it's over 80%, unfortunately. So yeah. there's a lot of single moms raising special needs children. And that's oftentimes why the grandparents sometimes will come in and set up the special needs trust also. Yeah, and, and, and we saw that quite often, that, that families struggle, and, and rightly so. This is not an easy task for any family to, to deal with this. But yeah. there's realities, as you pointed out earlier, that they all these pieces have to be thought of and, 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 and looked at annually to make sure that everything's in order for the benefit of that child because it's not going to be the child's fault. They're, they're the recipients of all the possible negative transactions that might occur in, in, in that family. And while we're talking about family you and I both know that guardianship is probably the largest, the, the biggest conversation we have with our families and trying to find that special guardian. I know that that causes stress to families. You want to want to walk the audience through guardianship as as a critical component to you know to, you know to these problems. Yeah, let's let's talk about two tools that are available. The special needs trust is one, and then to address the, the prior question, the other legal instruments are uh, guardianship and an ABLE account. So uh, let me deal with an ABLE account just because it, it follows the special needs trust and then we'll go right to guardianship. The ABLE account was uh, created under the Obama administration where a lot of families uh, went to the government and said, hey, you created these 529 college funding accounts where we can put money in and it grows tax-free so we can educate our typical children so they can go off to college. What about doing something like that for special needs family who's, who have greater needs? Finally, the Obama administration approved it. And a few years ago, the states enacted it. And it's become a, a, a topic of conversation. So for your listeners, I, I want to be sure we address it because there's a lot of confusion around it. Uh, an ABLE account allows an individual or a family to put up to $100,000 in an account uh, it costs $10 to set it up. 
you can put money into that account and that account is not that it counted, those assets are not counted towards their Medicaid or SSI eligibility. So it's a great tool. Um, they, you can put about $14,000 a year in it. And again, as I said, maximum 100000 over that, they'll lose eligibility. And for some of our special needs children, uh, my daughter, she's working. Um, they're earning money. And at the end of the day, they don't spend a lot of money. If she were to put that in her bank account, she could go over $2,000 by the end of the year. Uh, the ABLE account allows a place where the child can take their earnings, put it into a special account for their needs only, and it protects them and keeps them eligible for SSI benefits. So again, it's a great tool, but it doesn't replace the special needs trust as many people think, because one of the problems with an ABLE account is that there's a Medicaid payback provision, which means is when the child passes away, any assets left and the ABLE account are confiscated by Medicaid to repay them for any services they provide. Whereas a special needs trust, when the child passes away, any assets in a special needs trust can then be redirected to other family members. There's no confiscation or payback. So from the legal side and distribution side, that's critical. And that, John, to your point, the next critical piece on the legal side is guardianship. So guardianship is, without guardianship, once our children reach the age of 18, uh, technically when they walk into a doctor's office, you don't go in with them and whatever they choose, the decisions are all up to them. When they sign legal contracts, those legal contracts are binding. If they were to get married, that's con that's binding. So a lot of families, what we'll do is they'll explore the uh, option of guardianship. And guardianship is where you can allow a parent or a sibling to act as a guardian. It's a legal process. You apply, you go into the state, and the process is a little bit different in each state, but it's getting easier and easier to do. But an attorney meets with the special needs child, verifies that they don't have the capacity to make these decisions. And then it's a court process where you apply for guardianship. And now those decisions, such as signing a contract, um, um, going to the doctor, all of these different functions, now the parents still have the option to participate in. Whereas without guardianship, once the child's age 18, they're blocked from that, um, from that capability. So guardianship is a key thing to consider. Now, in some cases, uh, not appropriate. There's some higher functioning special needs adults. Um, I have a brother who's a year older than me. He's in his 60s. And his adage to me is he doesn't want his mother to be his guardian. He says, you know, there's other people out there and they're not the smartest, but they still get to make their life choices. And he wants that same option. And he has a great point. So that's, there's a big movement in the special needs community for self-advocacy, but that's a balance point that families need to measure and see what's best for the overall family and for the individual. Michael, I want to go back to something you touched on a little earlier with, with your daughter being employed. And can you walk through some of the misconceptions that people may have as it relates to uh, maybe getting back to some of the benefits that they could qualify for and what that what the special needs child is allowed to do in order to maintain those benefits? Yeah, Michael, I'm so glad you brought that up. That's probably the number one misconception. So when we have a special needs adult or we have anyone who's working, um, like all your listeners out there, most of us get our self-esteem from what we do for a living. Well, it doesn't change with special needs young adults. So when these adults get a job at a Home Depot or at a Wegmans or wherever the daycare center be an assistant, that is their self-esteem, um, as it is for all of us. And they take great pride in that. Now, the problem is a lot of families look at that income earning limit on SSI at $1,200 a month and go, oh, my child just got a raise. They're going to earn over $1,200 a month. And now I'm going to lose benefits. So I'm going to have them just work part-time 
and they end up working part-time. They're staying home three days a week, watching daytime TV because parents are under the misconception that that earned income is going to knock them out. And again, this speaks to the complication of the government SSI eligibility. And what they need to understand is that's not the fact. The fact is you're able, once you've collected one month of SSI, there's a number of programs that allow that special needs adult to continue to earn income above the $1,200 a month and remain eligible. So it's critical. They seek out an advisor who knows those tools. But in the state of New Jersey currently, you can earn up to $52,000 and still be SSI eligible if you know the right path to do it. So it's critical that your listeners understand that and seek out that advice when their child has an opportunity to increase their income. Hey, Michael, these are all excellent points and, and we're, we're uh, you know, running short of time uh, for today. But I'd love to have you come back and maybe get more specific in some of these areas. I think, I think we're going to probably get a lot of feedback uh, from this podcast, people are going to be interested in finding out more details. And I know they're state specific. People are going to be maybe asking questions about about some of the different states they're yeah you know, they're living in. Might be you know, some differences. Uh, but I, I wanted to thank you, Michael. This was this was absolutely fabulous. Um, and if any listeners want to reach out to Michael, they can most certainly go through us here at Copper Beach, and we can refer you to Michael. Uh, and our phone number is eight five six nine eight 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 three. Zero zero. We more than happy to uh, direct you to Michael. Uh, he's one of the best in the business. And I, again, Michael, I wanted to thank you for your time today, and we'll love to have you back. Thank you for the opportunity to get this information out to these families. Uh, it's been our pleasure. Thank you, sir. Guys, this was a fantastic podcast. I I definitely, um, you know, it's it's your guys' podcast, but I definitely think that he should be coming back. I, I think we, Michael, you and I could have talked another another half hour. That's why I said actually yeah. I said to Michael yesterday, we probably need two of these. Oh yeah, and more specific. But uh, I, Michael, this was great. I mean, yeah. I, it was great info, and uh, I knew it'd be awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so again, Michael, thank you for being on the show, John and Michael. Thank you for bringing them on the show. And of course, the last thank you always goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services Incorporated, a member of FINRA SIPC Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors Incorporated, an SEC registered investment advisor. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of APFS and APA. Any opinions expressed in this forum are not the opinion or view of American Portfolios Financial Services Incorporated APFS or American Portfolios Advisors Incorporated APA and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors.